it is. You know, Giles Dixon. Giles, I don't know if you're with us. Uh, welcome. Yes, I am. I hope you can and hear me. We can hear you loud and clear. Very nice to see you. Uh, Very I'll nice to see you too. I'll have to switch to Greek because our audience is Greek mostly. Of course. No, no, no. Yeah. Uh, yes. So when in Rome, we do a... Of course. A so, uh, σε ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ τον Giles Dixon για την υπομονή του. Ο Giles είναι πρόεδρος της uh, η CEO uh, της Win Europe, που είναι η συνολική, ας το πούμε, uh, uh, ένωση των βιομηχανιών uh, ολικής ενέργειας στην Ευρώπη και έχει τεράστια εμπειρία στον χώρο. Είναι στη θέση αυτή του 2015 uh, uh, και ελπίζω να μας πει για τις ευρωπαϊκές εμπειρίες. Giles, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be able to talk to you today. And many congratulations uh, to the Hellenic Wind Energy Association for organizing this excellent event. It's a pleasure to be taking part. I am going to go straight into hard finance issues, and I'm going to talk about how we minimize the costs of finance. Now, the most popular model across Europe for minimizing the costs of finance of offshore wind today are the contracts for difference. This is how they work. You're familiar with the system. The government runs an auction. The developers bid in with their strike price. This is the red line that you see here. Let's assume you win the auction at, let us assume, 50 euros a megawatt hour. There it is on the y-axis, 50 euros. That's your guaranteed revenue for the first 15 years of the project. When the market price is lower than 50 euros, the government pays you the difference. When it's higher than 50 euros, you pay back the difference to the government. That is the two-sided contract for difference. And of course, the sliding feed-in premium model that already applies in Greece is very similar in principle to this model. Now, there are other models. In the Netherlands, for example, the deal is that, yes, there is an auction, but it is a qualitative, not a quantitative auction. And if you are selected, then that is your revenue, the wholesale electricity price. So, let's assume you've won a CFD auction. Let's assume you've won a Dutch auction, you go to the banks and you ask them to lend you money to cover the very large capital investment that you need to make in order to build your offshore wind farm. Let's assume you're the bank looking at the winner of a CFD auction. He likes what he sees. He sees 15 years of very stable guaranteed revenues, and he is ready to lend lots of project finance debt to your project. He's happy that 80% of your finance should come from the debt that he is going to lend to you, perhaps with other banks. If he looks at the second project and he sees only the revenue coming from the variable, some might say volatile wholesale electricity, market price, he is much less happy. He will lend much less debt. Only 25% uh, probably, uh, then you'll need 75% equity as opposed to the 20% equity only that you'll need if you've got a CFD. So your financing costs under the second option will be much, much higher because you're having to put in much more equity than debt. It's more expensive. And the small amount of debt you do have from the banks, 25%, will be at much higher rates of interest. What does this mean for the total lifetime costs of electricity from your wind farm? Well, if you've got a CFD, you can expect to be getting 50 euros a megawatt hour lifetime LCOE because your financing costs are manageable. If you've got the second model, your financing costs are very large indeed, and that will have a huge impact on your lifetime LCOE of the project. And of course, you have to pass those costs on to the consumer, to the taxpayer. Offshore wind becomes much more expensive for society as a whole. So, these are the 
detailed uh, figures that show how the total lifetime LCOE differs between the project that has the two-sided CFD and the project that is completely merchant. And we'll be sharing this with you after the event, of course. Now, this is how auction prices for offshore wind have evolved in the last seven years in Europe. You all know this story. It has been a spectacular story. It has been delivered because of developments in technology. You all know what's happening there. Vestas have recently announced a 15 megawatt offshore wind turbine, which will be on the market very soon. GE already have a 12 and 13 megawatt turbine on the market. And Siemens Gamesa uh, are developing a 14 megawatt turbine. At the same time, of course, you have uh, governments running auctions, which have created the competitive dynamic, which have driven down the bidding prices. Now, what is the model? And we've touched on some of this already for who is responsible for what when they are developing an offshore wind farm. The blue here covers those things that the government bodies, whether it's the ministry or the permitting authority, are responsible for in different countries. The um, uh, red is what the developer is responsible for, and the green is what the transmission system operator is responsible for. And the key point to make here is that all of these models work. There's no right answer to this. But if in Greece you were to decide to go for the option of the transmission system operator being responsible for developing the, the, the grid connection and owning the grid uh, connection uh, between the coast and the offshore wind farm, and you were to say to Wind Europe, is that a sensible model? We would say, yes, it is. That model works. Okay, you all know the story about bottom fixed and uh, floating. You've just been uh, talking about it. Uh, the red areas are the only areas in Europe where we can do bottom fixed offshore wind. That's the sea up to 50 meters deep. Everything else needs to be floating. Now, the good news on floating, as you know, is that it is rapidly coming of age. Europe today has around 60 megawatts of floating offshore wind farms. You have uh, uh, High Wind Scotland uh, here, the Equinor project, and Windfloat Atlantic in Portugal, both in operation, both delivering very high capacity factors of 60% or more. By the end of next year, Europe will have over 300 megawatts of floating offshore wind farms that are in operation. So France is developing four pilot-sized projects with government financial uh, support. Uh, Norway, uh, again, Equinor are developing this power to platform project, High Wind Tampen, which is very interesting because there'll be 11 floating turbines located alongside oil and gas rigs, and they'll be providing the electricity to uh, power the water injection, substituting for the gas machines that are powering the water injection on the rigs today. Uh, the UK is building another uh, large project, more developments in Portugal. Now, in the eight following years, we then start to see the very big floating offshore wind farms. France will run an auction this year for a large floating offshore wind farm. They have identified the site already off the coast of Brittany, and that is going to happen, and they plan to run more auctions in subsequent years. Norway has identified two large zones for the development of very large floating offshore wind farms. The UK will be doing more. Spain will have a project in the Canary Islands. Portugal want to do more. I very much hope, ladies and gentlemen, that in a few years' time, we will be adding a Greek flag to this right-hand bar that you see before you, because we believe very strongly on in your potential. We are very impressed uh, uh, the approach that uh, you are all taking in, in the government and in the uh, industry and, and, and the, the regulatory authorities. 
So this is going to happen. And what will that do for the costs? Of course, today, floating offshore wind is more expensive than bottom fixed. But we believe that by 2030, we will be looking at these sort of LCOE numbers for floating offshore wind. That is conditional upon the build out in volume. Yeah, so getting to seven gigawatts is crucial in order to arrive at these sort of LCOE numbers. It's also crucial that there is investment in the upgrading of port infrastructure because the ports, of course, marshal the equipment, they send it out to the floating offshore wind farms. And of course, there's a lot of construction activity for floating turbines in ports as well. But those investments need to take place. There needs to be development of the supply chain also for floating offshore wind. Provided all of that happens, then there will be many projects across Europe achieving this sort of LCOE for floating offshore wind by 20. 30. Uh, this is some detail on France's plans for their auctions for both floating and bottom fixed offshore wind over the next four years alone. So you can see this year, 250 megawatt floating auction, uh, more floating auctions next year. They have set themselves a uh, price ceiling. So this year's auction, you can see it's got a price ceiling of 120 euros. It will have a sliding feed in premium system. So uh, very similar uh, 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 to your model, very similar to the two sided CFD model. They will have a lower price ceiling for the auctions that they do next year. And we think that that is uh, a workable model. They're keeping their options open, as you can see, for 2024. So they're going to do some bottom fixed auctions in dark blue in 22 and 23. And they know they will auction a thousand megawatts of offshore wind in 24. And it could be a thousand megawatts of floating. They'll see what's happening on the uh, evolution of costs. OK, very good. Now, um, I should just say something very briefly about hybrid offshore wind farms. These are wind farms that have connections to more than one country, more than one destination. These are beginning to happen. We have one uh, being built so far, that is Krieger's Flak number one that you see in the Baltic uh, being built with connections between Germany and Denmark. Uh, these are very good projects, these hybrid projects, because they allow you to pool both the generation and the transmission infrastructure, that saves money and it saves space in the sea. Uh, it also improves energy flows here between different countries in Europe, but it could improve energy flows also between different islands in Greece. These hybrids may well be an important uh, model uh, uh, for you as well. Okay. Um, let me just summarize a few things about the regulatory framework for offshore wind. We've talked about auctions. Uh, we've talked at length about CFDs sliding feed in uh, premium point three here. Uh, two points before that. Number one, it's so important that whatever the volumes are, whenever you propose to run the auctions, just tell people as early as possible and for as many years in advance as you possibly can so that there is clear visibility that then enables the industry to plan they can plan their investments in the supply chain in all the supporting infrastructure and that reduces long-term costs the clarity and the visibility is more important than the level of ambition so the wind industry would rather see Greece saying now in your legislation, we are going to auction, let us say, 500 megawatts every year or every two years. And we will definitely do that from now up until 2030 or even 2035. We would rather you did that than you said to us, Right, well, we'll have 1,000 megawatts now, and we might do another 1,000 megawatts in two years. We might do another 1,000 megawatts in four years. We don't know. Okay, there's the prospect of ambition, greater ambition, but it's no good 
without the clarity and visibility. So please give the industry clarity and visibility. That will reduce the costs for you in the long term. It will make it easier for you to crowd in all of the private investors. It will make it easier for you to plan. Now, technology-specific auctions. We still hear some people say that the European Commission, notably DG Competition, do not like technology-specific auctions. They want countries to auction renewables in technology-neutral auctions. That is wrong. DG Competition are perfectly happy for you to do technology-specific auctions, including specific auctions for floating offshore wind, maybe a specific auction for bottom-fixed offshore wind as well, completely separate to all the other auctions for onshore wind and solar PV. All you have to do as the Greek government is say to DG Competition, we have a policy goal of developing both onshore and offshore wind and Within offshore wind, we want to develop both floating and bottom fixed. We want to have different auctions. We want to have auctions also for solar PV. So long as you're clear that that is your policy goal, DG Competition will say, fine, do your technology specific auctions. Point four, so important to have a one stop shop for permitting. The countries that have been most successful in the development of offshore wind in Northwest Europe have had a one stop shop one government authority or agency that is responsible for all the permits for an offshore wind farm. The grid development we've talked about already and happy coexistence, extremely important. It is not too soon to start talking to the fishing industry and to fishing communities, to start talking to the military, to the environmental NGOs about your plans for offshore wind, because you need to carry all of those people with you. We work very hard on all of this in Wind Europe. We've just signed an MOU with all of Europe's leading biodiversity NGOs on a safe and sustainable way to build out offshore wind in Europe. And on the back of that MOU, we're now going to be developing protocols with these NGOs, very detailed protocols on the do's and don'ts of how you pile uh, turbines into the seabed, how you identify your zones, bearing in mind all the biodiversity interests. And we look forward to sharing those detailed protocols with you. We also have an aviation platform in Wind Europe where we talk to civil and military aviation authorities about all the issues around the happy coexistence of offshore wind farms with uh, air forces and with uh, civil aviation. And there are issues there around radar installations, around low altitude training, and so on. All of these factors one needs to take into account. With the fishing communities, we're quite happy for passive and pelagic fishing to take place inside offshore wind farms. It's okay. It's okay. The fish stocks are actually quite good because of the mollusks on the uh, foundations and structures. Only two countries today allow any form of fishing in offshore wind farms in Europe. That's the UK and Denmark. Others are going to start allowing it. And uh, it, it helps with the happy coexistence with fishing communities. And of course, coastal communities, um, uh, communities that have thrived in the past on the fishing and shipping and shipbuilding industries, they're all doing very well as a result of offshore wind. And there are many examples of small and medium sized towns in coastal areas around the North Sea, the Baltic Sea, that are booming economically now thanks to the investments that offshore wind is bringing. Um, just a few final points, if I may, to, to close. Um, what about this UK seabed leasing auction that they ran recently? What does Wind Europe think of that? Well, we do not think it was a very good uh, design for the auction. We think it was wrong that uh, they were requiring developers to pay for option fees it's money that they'll be required to pay now for the period while they're developing the offshore wind farm before they've finished building it and it's earning any revenue for them. It was also wrong that they didn't put enough capacity. It was only eight gigawatts up for auction and they want to build another 30 gigawatts over the next 10 years. So there were too many bidders chasing too little capacity and they shouldn't have had to be paying for these um, uh, option fees to cover the period during the
the development. It's fine to pay a seabed lease fee once you've built the wind farm, but it's wrong to require developers to pay that whilst they're still developing the wind farm. Uh, there was a frenzy in the bidding. You've seen the prices. They were huge. And I'm afraid those costs will have to be passed on to, to consumers. And there are people out there saying this could easily add £20 per megawatt hour to the prices at which the developers may be bidding into the next CFD auctions with as and when the UK government runs CFD auctions for these particular sites. So do not follow that UK model. It's fine to ask the developers to pay lease fees once they've built the uh, offshore wind farm, uh, but do not be tempted uh, to try and secure additional revenue uh, for the development period because those just that just adds to costs which will then need to be passed on to uh, consumers. Uh, in terms of how do you identify zones, we know you have this preference for the centralized model. We understand that. Fine. Um, if the government identifies areas, opens them up for offshore wind development, and then invites developers to uh, submit applications, maybe on a first come first serve basis, or setting out what the costs will be for their pre-feasibility studies and the uh, the, the the seabed surveys that they need to carry out that uh, development, pre-development uh, activity, um, and then just run the one auction, namely the CFD, the, the sliding feed in premium uh, auction, when uh, uh, you and the developers are ready to, uh, to do that. Um, the EBRD and the EIB will have a key role to play, of course, in financing projects, in also helping to finance the local banks in Greece to support projects as well. Um, and maybe there's a role for them to play in guaranteeing um, uh, the, the CFDs or the feed-in premium that, that the government uh, offers. Uh, the seabed rights should, should be offered for as many years as possible, at least uh, 30 years, maybe up uh, to uh, 60. And I think uh, those are all the key points of advice that we would wish to share with you based on the experience that we have so far in developing offshore wind in the rest of Europe. We look forward very much to continuing to work with you all. We're very excited about your plans. The members of Wind Europe are champing at the bit, if you will forgive that uh, English horse racing expression, to roll up their sleeves and really start working on this with you all. Thank you very much. Giles, thank you. That was fantastic. Uh, I look forward in 10 years time meeting for a, for a conference on some Aegean substation, you know, uh, in, in July, hopefully for work. But let me ask two small questions since you mentioned something very important about the, the competition, uh, the contracts for different competition. So in, in Britain, as we saw, the frenzy, as you described it, uh, it, it we have, we essentially we have two competitions. One at the beginning about the license fee, and we had some like 200 million per year you know, to rent the space, which is ridiculous. Yeah. And then a, a sort of competition which is dedicated to offshore uh, wind. So it is technology specific. So the same people who pay 200 million are then going to comp compete amongst each other at the second stage. So you can see how the bidding basically will be very high at that stage. Yeah. Are you, are you saying that Greece, which now starts from a completely blank slate, there's no precedent, so we start from scratch. Are you saying that the, 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 the auction for contracts for difference should be at the very beginning or at the middle, so after the stage of preliminary zone exploration, identification and development? It's in the middle, isn't it? You should have it as late as possible. Yeah. Okay. First, you can set the areas, you permit the projects, yeah, you go through the process of the government opening up the zones, uh, getting the uh, expressions of interest, the applications from the developers, as I say, on a first come first serve basis or with the developers setting out the costs for all the seabed surveys and uh, feasibility studies that they need to do. All of that happens. The consent is acquired. The developers get the permits and then and only then should you run the CFD auction. And now I have a, a, a very tricky question, which you don't have to answer. I haven't warned you about it because it only occurred to me as the speakers were speaking this morning. 
Uh, we need land or space in the sea. We need an exclusive economic zone in the Aegean, or we need uh, more than six nautical miles of territorial waters. Yeah. The neighbor to the east yeah. is, seems to be objecting to all of these. Do you have a view about exclusive economic zone and development? Uh, because I mean, the environmental I mean, benefits for, for the Aegean and, and, and for European waters. And do you have any sense if there is an industry across the pond, so to speak, in Turkey, mm. that is also interested in developing similar uh, offshore wind farms so that there is a win-win scenario where both mm -hmm. sides sit down and say, well, look, we had exclusive economic zones. We could go to 50 miles, 100 miles, whatever, and develop this without any impact on land and so on and so forth. Is that a possibility? Do you have anything to say? I, mean, I know it's a question I haven't asked you before, but it's been in my mind. You know, There is a risk. There's a geopolitical issue here, isn't there? There is indeed, yes. Now, let me make one observation. Turkey is committed very strongly to the expansion of wind energy in Turkey. And they've built a lot of onshore wind farms in recent years. And I think onshore wind is now close to 9% of all of Turkey's mm -hmm. electricity. Yeah, they have several gigawatts and it's growing rapidly. They built over one gigawatt of new onshore wind last year. They are very committed also to being uh, quite a strong industrial player in wind energy. And they've built a very impressive industrial hub around Izmir uh, with lots of factories and lots of members of Wind Europe have built factories there, making blades, towers. Uh, Siemens Gamesa even plan to be building nacelles in Turkey. So arguably turkey has a very strong industrial policy and economic interest in greece developing offshore wind yeah I, I i just make that observation i'm not qualified or competent to talk about the geopolitical aspects of um eezs i know there are many many issues at uh play there yes uh, and I don't think it would be appropriate for me to, to comment. Uh, Turkey has also got an interest in developing its own offshore wind. They tried doing an auction three years ago and it didn't work because they were trying to do it too soon. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they hadn't done all of these first steps that we've just been talking about. Yeah. Uh, and the industry didn't bid in because it just didn't seem very credible at the time. And I think Turkish government accepted they'd probably moved a bit too soon. Uh, but they are keen to go back and to try and do it. And I think they have identified some zones um, uh, south of Anatolia and also in the Black Sea. Yeah. And of course, Romania and Bulgaria are also interested in developing offshore wind in the uh, Black Sea. Uh, but please let me just reinforce the point to, to answer your previous question. One auction only. The CFD auction, don't do the seabed leasing auction at the start and leave that CFD auction to, to as late as possible. That's extremely useful. Thank you, Giles, very much. We may, we may need you at the end for Q&A. Fine. If you're around. Thank you very much. Um,